seated. Well, welcome again to Calvary. My name is Robert Smith. I'm the student pastor here, and I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. If you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians uh, chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible or Bible app on your device, that's okay. Uh, There's Bibles all around you in the pews. Uh, Go ahead and grab one of those. Open to page 1,244. You'll find the book of Ephesians there between Galatians and Philippians. Now, as, as a big room, there's a lot of differences among us. There's a lot of similarities, though. And I think a, a common similarity that we all have is that uh, we all, I think, would agree that hypocrisy is annoying. Hypocrisy is annoying, it's frustrating, it's difficult to see and be a part of, Um, and it it takes all kinds of shapes and forms, and it might be that police officer that's off duty that you see doing 20 over the speed limit, or it might be that you found out your personal trainer binge eats on pizza and ice cream on his days off, or it might be any number of other things where someone doesn't live the way they say they do, or doesn't live the way uh, they say they believe, and I found myself in one of these situations about three years ago. Uh, My wife, Amber, and I had just moved to Kentucky to start seminary, and I had gotten a job with the campus uh, media department, and we had this big event coming up. It was this big festival. It was this annual thing, and we were building this facade. It was this building front. It was about 60 feet long. It was about two stories high, and it was like this, this building front to a Wild West building, complete with saloon and library and barbershop and all this. And we had been working for months on this thing, and especially in the weeks prior to it, painting and organizing, building, framing this structure. And it was two days before the event, and this massive storm comes through town. And it pours rain on all of our supplies and equipment, and like some of the paint's running because it's still wet. But the worst thing was that it brought a lot of wind with it, and this 60-foot-long facade through that wind, managed to find its way to its side. And it lay there on the ground, twisted and mangled and impaled by the scaffolding that it had fallen on. And this thing was a mess. And it was two days before the event. And so we're all kind of wondering, okay, what in the world are we going to do with this thing? And so the leaders of the event, they go off and they do their whole leader thing. They go and talk and plan and strategize. And they're like, okay, we have this plan. Here's how we're going to rebuild it. And And so we get to work, Uh, and it's late that evening, and we're still working. We're not making any progress because none of our power tools are working. We've got all this work to do. We don't have drills. We don't have saws. We don't have nailers. None of this stuff's working because our compressors and generators are just flooded by all the water. And so a bunch of guys are working on them because they know if we can get this going, we'll make progress. We'll make headway. And as I'm working, I see someone come up and start talking to these guys, And this guy turned out to be the vice president of the school. And he had just gotten out of a meeting. He's in this nice suit and shiny dress shoes and a nice leather briefcase. I'm thinking, oh, he's here to help. (laughs) No, no, he wasn't. Uh, And so he starts talking to these guys and finds out what they're doing and finds out they're, you know, been working on these generators for a while. And, And then he starts to talk. And he says, you know, you guys are wasting time on this. And he continues to critique and criticize them and rebuke them for wasting all this time working on these generators and compressors. That's kind of weird. Maybe I didn't hear him right. I need to move a little closer to hear this. And so he keeps talking, and the next thing that comes out of his mouth just struck me. And he says, you know, the Amish didn't need power tools to build houses. You don't need power tools to build this. You just need to get to work. I go, man, this guy's a jerk. (laughs) And I hadn't met him yet, so obviously I didn't say that out loud because he's my boss and their boss and everyone's boss. But even though I hadn't met him, I had heard some things about who he was and what he did. And, and I knew that he was, you know, the, the vice president. He led all these departments. He was over all these things. And, and I had heard that he had written a couple books. And the first was on, you know, biblical manhood, how to be a you know, manly man according to the Bible. I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, but the second one that I thought of in this moment was that he had written this book on servant leadership. <laughs> and here's a guy who comes as a, a resident expert on servant leadership and just completely fails in that moment completely blew it and lost all credibility among us. And, and we saw him as a, a hypocrite because he's this expert, and here he is doing the opposite of what he claimed to be an expert at. Um, and we face that, that struggle in our life as well. We face that struggle of not wanting to be a hypocrite, 
Not wanting to be seen as a fake or a two-face or someone who doesn't live up to what they say they are. And last week we heard that we're all called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. But here's the thing. We cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. It all comes down to character. That's at the, the heart of all of this. And it's the second core value of Calvary because we understand if we fail at the point of, Calvary, uh, of character, then we fail to lead people to Jesus, to lead people to that point of influence and, and understanding about who Jesus is. Because if we don't live the way that we say we do, if we don't follow through with what we say we believe, then people will see us as that hypocrite, that two-face, that fake. But here's the cool thing. If we do this right, if we win at this point of character and we succeed at being consistent with who we say we are, then, then people see that and know that. And we have influence in their life. And so this is an important topic for us. And the Bible gives us an outline for the path to start down to do this. So Ephesians chapter 5 is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 this morning. And it says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, if we want to reflect Jesus' character, we have to know that character comes from learning to imitate Christ. Character comes from learning to imitate Christ, Jesus, our Savior. Because see, when we look at people's life, when we look at their character, we commend and, and celebrate things like honesty and integrity and love and patience and kindness. Say, these are good character traits in people's life, and, and we find ourselves gravitating to imitate people like that. But see, Jesus was the perfect example of all of those things. When he, he loved, he did so without fault. He was patient without frustration. He, he was kind even in the most difficult of circumstances because Jesus was perfect in every way. And so if we're going to imitate someone and imitate someone's character, we need to look to Jesus. In fact, we were created to do that. Part of our core being is created to imitate Jesus and look to him as our example. But this passage gives us some, a, a glimpse into how this kind of works, the dynamic here. Because it says that we're to do this as God's beloved children or God's dearly loved children. And see, a lot of times we want to see God as like this manager who's like task-driven in our life. But that's not the case. He's not saying you need to get this done. He's not even our, our life coach saying, you know, it's probably best in the long run if you kind of do these things. I see this path in your life. Instead, he's our heavenly father who loves us and has a plan for us and wants to journey alongside us. But at the same time, he wants us to imitate his son, Jesus, because he knows that that is the best path for our life. And so the, the idea of imitating God shouldn't frustrate us or, or make us exhausted to think about it, but it should excite us and motivate us. It should excite us in the same way that a small boy gets excited to imitate his dad. In the same way that I got excited when I was a boy to imitate my dad and to, to go out in the garage and work on stuff with him and put on his extra set of coveralls even though they were way too big. And as I, I grew and progressed as a teenager and adult, I started to see that I imitated his character traits, his honesty and integrity and hard work ethic. And so that's what God wants from us. He wants us to look to him. He wants us to look to Jesus and look and imitate his character, imitate his characteristics and embrace his values. That's what God wants from us. But since it describes us as his children, it shows us that there's, there's a relationship here. This isn't about a to-do list. It's not a, about just tasks and doing all the right things. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And a relationship with Jesus is what saves us. And so if you're here and you haven't started in that relationship, the Bible says that it's as easy as confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you do those things, it goes on to say that you will be saved. So if you're here this morning, you haven't started that, that's your entry point to all this. That's that, that point of beginnings for you where, you know, I don't know where to start with this whole God thing, this whole Jesus thing. That's your, that's your point right there, to simply believe in Jesus and confess him as your savior. But since it's a relationship, it doesn't stop there either. 
You know, this summer we spent five weeks talking about marriage and, and talking about how to have a better marriage relationship and how to go through that for better or for worse. And the thing that we saw over and over again was that all these areas in marriage required effort and required time and investment. And the same is true in, in our friendships and other areas, but it's also true with our relationship with Jesus. It takes time and investment to pour into that to grow closer to Jesus and have a good and solid relationship with him. So this morning, my question to you is, how is your relationship with Jesus doing? Is it at that point where it's a little neglected, a little stagnant, a little dull because there hasn't been that investment there? Or are you pouring into it and pouring in your time and attention and energy so it's healthy and strong and vibrant? See, that would be my hope for you and for all of us to have that healthy relationship with Jesus because if we want to imitate him, we have to know him. To know him, we have to be close to him in relationship because Jesus is our, our example. He's our demonstration for how to live. But there's another component to this as well. Because he is our demonstration, we need someone to walk alongside us and show us how it works in our life. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in your life, and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. See, the Holy Spirit's the one to walk alongside of us and show us, hey, this area of your life needs to be molded more towards the character of Christ. And here's how that needs to take place. He's the one that, that brings those lessons into our life. Since he is our, our teacher, he brings courses and classes to us. Because God wants us to be prepared, he even gives us an outline of this. He gives us an outline for what the Holy Spirit's going to teach us in our life. So in Galatians chapter 5, it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the lessons of Jesus' character that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into your life. But just like all uh, courses, just like all schools, there's some, some attributes that we need to know about how he's going to teach us these things and, and what these classes are like. And the first thing that we need to know is that these courses are not optional. See, when I was going through school, one of my favorite things was that I got to pick some of the classes. I got to say, oh, that looks fun. I'll take that one. Or if I started in a class and it turned out to be a whole lot of work, I could just be like, yeah, I'm not going to take that one. I'm going to go get this different one. But see, in every program of study, there's those classes that they deem essential. There's those core classes, and they say, these are the essential things that someone needs to know if they've gone through this program. And these courses are not optional. Well, those things are the Holy, the Holy Spirit has those in our life, and those are the fruit of the Spirit. Those things that I listed, those are those core classes that we must know and understand. And so we can't choose to just skip them because we don't want to learn or we don't want to look at that topic. One of the most popular things is patience, right? We hear all the time, oh, don't pray for patience because then bad things will happen. You'll have to be patient. And I, I confess I've been guilty of thinking that and maybe even saying it a few times, but here's the thing. Patience is a required course. So God's going to work to teach me patience whether I pray for it or not. So in those times when I'm driving and someone's doing 10 under the speed limit, and I just want to like ram the back of their car, the Holy Spirit's there saying, hey, you need to be patient. This is, this is one of your lessons for today. It's your lesson in patience. In the same way, when I'm on my computer and it's like running super slow or I got a slow Wi-Fi connection, and I just want to like break it because it's not doing what I want it to do. God's teaching me patience. See, the Holy Spirit's going to bring those lessons into your life, even if you don't want to learn them because they're required courses. Because they're not optional, that means that if we fail one of these courses, we take it again until we pass. See, we can't just mark down an F for patience or an F for self-control and just move on and think that God's okay with that. No, we repeat them until we learn that lesson. And so some of us might be in remedial patience. We might be in remedial self-control. Or we might be taking Joy 101 for the fourth time. Because we repeat the classes, the courses, the lessons until we learn and pass. And so we need to be attentive students. We need to be ready to learn from the Holy Spirit in our life. The other thing we need to know is that these courses follow God's schedule, not ours. 
See, some of us in this room are the type of person to say, this looks really difficult, this task, this lesson, this whatever. So I'm going to start with that, and then everything's downhill after there. And some of us, like myself, are the type of person to go, this looks really hard, I'm going to do it last. I'm just going to like put it off, but I'm going to do it so I can gain some momentum from doing the easy stuff. But see, the courses don't work like that. We can't choose when we learn something. We can't say, well, life's hard right now, so I don't want to work on joy. I want to work on something else because that's going to be easier in this moment. Because God has this all laid out for us, and the Holy Spirit is going to bring these things into our life in his perfect timing. And because God has a plan, we can trust in that. Because it says that God has a plan to prosper and not to harm us. A plan to give us hope and a future. So we can trust that his timing, his plan, his schedule is better than ours. And the last thing, and probably the most important thing we need to know about these courses, is that these courses are graded on improvement, not perfection. See, when we look at the character of Christ, when we look at his life, when we look at God's word, We see a very high standard. We see a standard that we can't meet. And we see courses like this, and we've we've seen, oh, I've failed those. I failed one of these really, really bad. Or I failed it over and over and over again. But see, failing a course doesn't mean we fail the whole program. Because God knows that we are going to fall short. He knows that we're going to stumble. He knows that we're going to fail. And that's the very reason that he sent Jesus. Because we needed a way to get to God, even though we do fail and stumble and sin. And so because of that, God's not looking for perfection in our life. He's looking for improvement. And so instead of looking at these areas of Christ's character and asking yourself if you are perfect, instead look at them and ask yourself, have I improved in this area over the last six months, over the last year or five years? Because that's where God is looking in your life, for improvement and small steps forward in your journey with him. And see, this is, this is at work in my life as well. This is my first weekend preaching here at Calvary on a weekend. I've been here about four months leading the, the student ministry here and uh, doing that on a weekly basis. But they've entrusted this weekend to me to preach. And as I prepared and looked ahead to this, every part of me wanted this to be flawless and perfect. I wanted like the, the words to be perfectly crafted and so that it would just be amazing. But we both know that's not going to happen. <laughs> and and the, the first service last night on, on Saturday, there's a whole paragraph that I just skipped. And I, I didn't realize it until towards the end. So there's, there's no way to recover that. And so perfection isn't something that's possible. But see, what I do know is that improvement is possible. My hope is that the next time I teach will be a little better than this, and the next time would be a little better, and so on and so forth, so that at some point I can look back at this moment and say, God's really helped me grow and improve since that first time. He's been at work in my life so I can improve and grow, and that's what he wants to do in your life. He wants to help you progress forward in small steps so that you can be closer and closer to the character of Christ. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is committed to teaching you the character of Christ. He's going to do this because uh, we need to represent him to the world around us. He's going to teach us this character because we have people watching us. We have people watching us in our homes and how we interact with our family, in our workplaces, how we interact with our bosses and coworkers. There's people watching how we interact with service people in restaurants and people out in the community to see if What we say matches how we live. And the Holy Spirit is going to teach us these lessons. The only question for us is, what kind of student will we be? This morning, what kind of student will you be towards the Holy Spirit's courses in your life? My prayer is that you would be excited and attentive to learn from him so that you can better reflect Christ's character. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have called us and you've given us the opportunity to lead people towards yourself. And God, we all admit that we have fallen and and messed up. God, we failed some of these courses. And so we thank you that you've given us grace in our life, that even though we have done these things, you will still use us and you will still love us. 
God, help us to uh, just look towards improvement in our life and help us to better reflect you to the world around us. God, help us to let our light shine before others so they might see your good works and give glory to our Father who's in heaven. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen. Let's stand and worship.